Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Nimi Reichenberg, and I am the CMO here at Simplify. Uh, and I'm very happy to uh, start what is actually going to be a four-part series uh, of conversations with Forrester analysts Joseph Blankenship and Dr. Chase Cunningham on security operations trends, security orchestration automation and response, and how it relates to modern security operations, things like zero trust, and the MITRE ATT&CK framework, how it lends itself to server providers uh, and anything else we can uh, wrap our, head, uh, our heads on. Uh, uh, gentlemen, it's a pleasure to, uh, to welcome you. Thanks for having me. Yep, thanks for having us. All right, so you know, if you're in security operations uh, and you haven't been hiding under a rock for the last five years, you've probably heard the term about the term SOAR, which stands for Security Orchestration Automation and Response. Uh, and I wanted to, um, for you guys, um, uh, Joe and Chase, to maybe um, weigh in and give your perspectives as both industry analysts and, and security practitioners on where you see SOAR fit in in general. And then we, maybe we'll also uh, talk a little bit about this day and age of the pandemic and, and how SOAR can apply to that. But uh, Joe, maybe we'll start with you, JB, and, and, and get your thoughts. Sure, yeah, Nemi, happy to. You know, <clears throat> When I first started covering this space here at Forrester about five years ago, you know, I was actually initially really excited you know, about the whole idea that we had automation platforms coming online to actually help uh, with, with security operations. You know, I came to Forrester from an MSSP background and I can remember sitting in our you know, security operations center, you know, with uh, you know, some of the SOC analysts and stuff and watching what they did all day and just being kind of like mind, you know, boggled by some of the uh, some of the workflow or lack of workflow, I guess I should say, right? Um, just people doing a lot of manual tasks, copy paste, email and stuff around. And so, you know, you know, you know, me sitting there and trying to trying to learn and you know, do all that kind of stuff. I was always kind of just curious. I'm like, how how do we how do we keep track of all this, right? Uh, and, and how do you maintain consistency when everyone seems to be doing their own thing? And the analysts were always kind of like, "Well, this is just the way it is," right? And I'm like, I kept thinking to myself, there has to be a better way. And for one thing, is an MSSP, they're coming to us and they're saying, "Hey, MSSP, you're supposed to be experts at this. You're supposed to have all these great processes and tools." And I'm like, uh, "Processes and tools? Eh, not not really. What we have is we're kind of." So a lot of uh, you know bodies at a problem and try to solve it just like you would uh, in your own you know security operations. Only we're going to do it at a greater scale across a bunch of different clients. So when I, I first saw you know uh, some of the source stuff coming online, the first time Nimi I ever talked with, with you, right? I was like, you know, this is this is actually a much better way to solve a problem than to continue throwing bodies at it and to continue doing what we've been doing uh, in security operations for as long as I've been in this space, uh, which is uh, you know lots of manual effort, lots of Excel, lots of notepad, lots of email, uh, and lots of sort of, you know, sort of like operational dysfunction, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of one of the, the terms that that I like um, um, when you know when used in reference to to security operations and, and that sort um, helps alleviate is, is swivel chair integration, right? It's uh, some of you may have heard that term, right? It's where the tools aren't integrated and the only way you integrate it is by swiveling your chair from one screen to the other, right? Usually with the copy pasting, pasting between tools. So I know we've talked about, um, you know, the, the, the manual processes, we've talked about the, the, the multitude of, of tools that aren't integrated. Uh, Chase, maybe you can also uh, talk a little bit about with the daily blocking and, and tackling and an alert overload has been talked about uh, at length, but you know, as a security practitioner, uh, give us a little bit about uh, a little bit of your perspective on this. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've run socks at the in the government space and I've run them in the corporate space. And I specifically remember one of the, the worst instances I had was the first day I showed up to do SOC operations. Um, they dropped, I think it was 9,000 uh, 9, records on me the first day. Um, and it was like, hey, get going. And it was like, with what? You know, and the question becomes like, how do, I mean, are you going to give me a, what? I mean, I, I need a shovel to dig through the paperwork just to get to the, you know, actual operations side of this thing. So the ability to do stuff 
in an automated and orchestrated fashion is a requirement for operational capability. And that that's also why when you look at the ZTX framework, which is the practical implementation framework for zero trust, that we have specific wicket in there for automation orchestration because you can't operate in this space at speed and scale without capabilities that that cross that chasm. Right. Now we say, you know, the 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 bad guys are using automation left, right, and center, and just to, to you know to be able to effectively respond to attacks that are highly automated with detection and response processes that are mostly manual, right? That, that you have to break some of that, some of that asymmetry. Um, JB, maybe let's talk a little bit about, so I th again, I think the kind of the foundations of SOAR are, are well understood. Like you said, um, it, it, as, as, as Chase said, it doesn't take more than one day, probably in a SOC to realize that the old day of doing things with you know, so many things to get done and, and manual processes, um, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, not really setting yourselves uh, up for success to say the least. Uh, so, you know, this year uh, we, we have a pandemic. Uh, I think it shifted two, um, two fundamental things in, I guess, across all functions, but we're talking about security and security operations. One is of course the concept that most people are working remotely and security as we know, well, to do security effectively, it's a highly collaborative function, right? We're used to the analyst huddled together in that dark room with all the monitors, tapping each other on the soldier. Oh, have you seen this? Have you seen this? So obviously everybody is now remote. Uh, and then of course, the fact that not just security, but your workforce as, has remote, I think has um, mandated that organizations are more agile in terms of, of rolling out these playbooks to, to new threats, um, that and new threat vectors that are relevant when, when in, in this day and age where employees are remote. So maybe talk a little bit about what you've been hearing from customers um, around security operations in this age of a, of a pandemic that we live in now. Yeah, and I mean, you know, usually when we talk about <coughs> socks, right, we are thinking about that dark room with all the, uh, with all the screens, you know, the kind of the mission control kind of a deal, right? And in, in let's, let's, let's think about it, man, in a large, uh, in most cases, that's really sort of a showpiece, right? So we can take people and we can show them security getting done because it feels like a little safety blanket, a little security blanket, right? I see people in there. I see people with ponytails and whatever, and you know they're at work in the dark. They must know what they're doing. There's usually some PP maps up on the wall. It looks like things are happening, right? It makes everybody feel good. Now here comes the pandemic, and we suddenly blow up the notion. Uh, that everyone's got to be in a room facing the same direction, blowing, you know, par virus particles on each other. You know, we send them all home and let them all work remotely. And lo and behold, you know, the world did not come to a, to a crashing halt um, when we sent SOC operators home. What did slow down, however, was our ability to do exactly what you said, Nimi, which is face-to-face -face collaboration. So we started relying on tools like, you know, Teams and chat and Skype and uh, everything else, um, you know, to try to do collaboration. As soon as you do that, though, right? What what happens? We start losing track of bits and pieces of you know, what goes on during an investigation because now you're scattered in all these different places. And you know, for the longest time, we were using things like Outlook as our system of record. You know, why is Outlook the system of record? Well, because everyone's got it, right? And it archives email. So hey, I'll just put all my notes in the Outlook and I'll send it off to Chase, and then Chase has got all the all the data on this thing. That's not a really efficient way to do things either, right? So I think one of the things that we found with the uh, with with the pandemic is if we did not have um, you know something like a SOAR in place or at least a good uh, case management system in place where we're tr keeping track of our notes, we're keeping track of all the context around an incident, and we're continuing to add to that and and allow multiple uh, analysts and operators to to collaborate. Uh, in an environment that is going to save that information. Instead, what we end up with is still the, a bit of the same mess. Um, or you, you see a lot of ad hoc sort of efforts, like maybe a SharePoint server, and everyone dumps their notes in there. And I don't know about anybody else's SharePoint instance. Most every SharePoint instance I've ever seen uh, is not really that searchable. Uh, it doesn't really index all that well. So if you need to go back and pull back those notes and try to figure out what the heck happened in an incident, um, <clears throat> chances are that's not going to be a very, uh, very successful endeavor. Yeah, so I think that's a couple of the things we've seen with the uh, with the pandemic, and it's actually, you know, and by the way, 
because we're now you know, kind of demonstrating we can do all this stuff remotely, we're also kind of opening ourselves up to where we can do security operations just about anywhere, not just in the dark room, right? But we do need good collaboration tools uh, to allow that to happen more effectively. Right, to your last point, what I think, you know, there's, there's um, all this discussion about the new normal and how much of this remote work um, will stay with us, um, you know, once the pandemic is over. Um, and what I hear from, from security uh, folks out there, you know, everybody um, you know, knows about the, the terrible skill shortage that we face in security. And what some of these companies um, I found out said, hey, if I, if I don't have a SOC uh, and I can hire anywhere, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in a much better shape where, uh, in terms of my ability to, to find and retain security talent. So you know, when it comes to security, I actually think that um, we will retain a lot of this remote work. And even when people come back and, and you know, those dark rooms will be popular again, I, I still think companies say, hey, we can actually now hire anywhere in the country or anywhere in the world uh, and, and that will help us uh, fill those hard to fill positions. So I think, you know, the concept of remote security operations is not going to go away once, once the pandemic is, is over. Uh, Chase, I'd love, I'd love to hear some of the things that you um, have experienced firsthand or hearing from, from Forrester clients uh, about security operations in the age of pandemic, you know, automation, orchestration, how everything fits into that picture. I think you need to unmute. No Zoom conversation is complete without the sentence, you're on mute. So we, we paid our dues to that sentence. You need to unmute, Chase. Weird, I hit the unmute button, but sometimes technology doesn't work, which is good that we're talking about when technology doesn't necessarily work because there's proof positive. Uh, even a guy with a PhD can mess up, you know, Zoom. Um, but really what... <laughs> You know the 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 space that we're in is is one where it's not a question of do the tools exist to do the job. It's not a question of do we have um, capability. I mean, JB and I've even written about this, and we've gotten a lot of uh, folks that have sort of dinged us for saying that we don't think that there necessarily is a lack of human capital in the space. We think that there is a technology optimization to solve the problem intelligently. Problem. Um, I I would stand on. I'll die on the hill. I don't think we have a lack of human capital. I think what we do have is we have an issue where we have too many tools, not enough people to use them intelligently because there's not enough automation capability available. Now that is where we need to move to uh, because that is where you start gaining ground. Uh, and it, you know, it, the other thing that you see too in this space is uh, a lot of the things that we have got as far as manual sort of operations should be automated. Um, you know, there, there's a way to make things better and solve that human capital crisis by not making people do things that a machine can do. I mean, that's what machines are for, right? Excellent. So um, I think we're, we're just about to, to um, wrap up part one. And thank you, gentlemen. I think this is a good, good overview of you know, where source sits in the market in general, and also um, you know, how it applies to the age of, of, uh, of the pandemic. In part two, uh, I think we'll cover some of, some of the real need and see how SOAR integrates with some of the key uh, frameworks that organizations use like Zero Trust and MITRE, so stay tuned.